they'll return to us at the invitation to community life. Our scripture reading this day is from the Gospel of Luke. We're back in Luke's Gospel. From the 10th chapter, verses 1 to 11. I invite you to listen now for God's living word. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe it off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the good news. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When we first hear the instructions from Jesus in this story, it doesn't really sound like any mission that any of us would like to sign up for. Commentator Caroline Lewis says they sound like orders received from Central Command on the series Mission Impossible. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to be an advanced team for Jesus. Your message is urgent. The kingdom of God is at hand. So go only with what you've got on your feet already. Don't take time to pack a bag. The journey will take you to places you've never been before, and you may not be welcomed in. In fact, it's likely some will reject you. So consider yourselves lambs in the midst of wolves. You'll be at risk, but don't take anything for your protection. In fact, don't take anything at all. No purse, no bag, no shoes. That's it. Now go. As the disciples take in these instructions, you might think they'd hesitate or ask more questions or do something that indicate that they're worried. I would be, wouldn't you? I mean, lambs get injured by wolves. They get killed. And all these years later, after this story was told, we know it's still true. For weeks now, we've witnessed one tragic, violent act after another, and the number of lives lost, the lambs slaughtered. I don't even want to count them. Sometimes the world just seethes with heat 
and danger. And it can leave us feeling raw and vulnerable. It's true now. It was true then, too. So you think the disciples would be worried. But if this crowd receiving instructions from Jesus is at all concerned, they keep it to themselves. Perhaps it was because just a chapter before this one, Jesus had sent the 12 disciples out the same way. No money, no bread, no walking stick, no change of clothes. A test run, I guess. Thank goodness they'd all come back all right. And it seems they're ready to give it a go, another go. But then again, these 12 disciples were the same ones who didn't hesitate for a minute when Jesus met, met them beside the lake where they were fishing. He had stepped into their lives with the power of love and life so compelling that when he said, follow me, they dropped their nets and they'd been following him ever since. And it doesn't take long for others to join them. We already know from spending time in Luke in previous weeks that the Jesus we meet in this gospel keeps expanding the circle of ministry, drawing more and more people into his healing embrace, drawing them in as he moves along. The number of disciples, we're told, is now up to 70, which is a lot more than 12. But the reference here in the text is actually larger than that. Because 70 is the number at the table of nations named in Genesis, the beginning of the Bible. So when the story tells us that 70 are getting ready to go out in Jesus' name, it means that the message of peace the disciples carry is meant for all the nations, for the whole world. And the good news, Luke told us at the very beginning of his gospel, chapter 1, he told us that the good news is for all people. Go all the way back to Christmas, when Jesus was born, when a heavenly host shimmered in the sky, when music rang out in the crisp midnight air. The song of joy the angels sang was this one. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill among all people. All people, all of them, all of us, every one of us. It's the theme song of Jesus' ministry. All lives matter. Yes, but even now, even today, all these years later, we still don't always know how to live the truth of that message. We still act as if some lives matter more than others. In spite of our best intentions, we still act as if some lives are less worthy of the greatest care, as if some lives are more expendable than others. And so these days, it's important that we lift up those who are being put down again and again, and to say again and again until we hear it more clearly. Black lives matter. We need to say it because the house our African American brothers and sisters are living in is on fire and it will take all of us noticing so that together we can figure out how to put it out. We, we are living in a time of urgency because black men and women and children keep dying. And now also those whose calling is to protect and serve them. We can sense some urgency in Luke's story of Jesus too. 
The ministry of Jesus has moved beyond what he himself is able to do. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few, Jesus says. So what does he do? Jesus gathers his followers and then he sends them out ahead of him. Here the disciples are not following Jesus. They aren't behind him anymore. They are out in front. No longer are they simply watching Jesus and listening to what he has to say. They become active participants in his ministry. Jesus sends them on ahead of him to prepare a place for him to arrive. And the 70 are to prepare for him by doing all the things that they've seen him do to bring healing, to proclaim peace, to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And then, as if that in itself isn't enough to make them tremble, Jesus sends them out with, without any equipment or supplies. No published tracks to take door to door, no prepackaged kits to help with healing, no trail mix or freeze dried meals to fortify them on the road, only the briefest of plans to guide them. There is a warning about the risks of their journey, but there are no weapons for them to carry. No knives or swords in case they meet danger or resistance, which surely they will. Jesus knows from his own experience that they will. But retaliation is not his way. There is no eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Even when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to be taken away to be crucified, and a disciple pulled out a sword to defend him, Jesus said, put it away. He disarmed his disciples. No more of this, he said. So that even in, this, in these days, when we are full of rage and grief, when we want to fight back, when we want to retaliate for the sake of righteousness, when we feel called to come to the defense of the defenseless and to defend those who seek to defend them, and even when the one we want to defend is Jesus himself, Jesus said no. No violence. He said no. Which is why... Jesus sends the 70 out with empty hands. Which is why he says to the disciples, when the message you carry is rejected, when you yourselves are rejected, shake the dirt out of your shoes, wipe the dust off, and move on. It's the first form of non-violent protest which is why we choose to light candles instead of loading firearms, which is why people across the country sit down and lie down, disrupting things peacefully, giving witness to a way other than the way of force. Jesus sends them out with empty hands, because he knows that the power of vulnerability is much greater than the power of violence. He sends them with no provisions so that they are required to depend on the good will, the generous spirit, the openness, the hospitality of others to provide for them. There is no other way to take this journey. Guest and host will receive each other and they will exchange gifts. Together, they will become the peace the disciples proclaim. The messengers 
and the message are one. And in order to underscore the power of this radical reliance, Jesus then sends the disciples out in pairs, two by two by two. Take nothing except another person. Another person, which is actually the most important thing any of us can take anywhere. It's the best gift we are given, the gift of one another. A couple of days ago, I remembered a photograph I saw last winter, shortly after the grand jury in Ferguson, Missouri, decided against indicting the police officer who shot and killed 18-year-old Michael Brown. The photo was taken at a peaceful protest in Portland, Oregon. Maybe you remember the picture too. It's of a white Portland police sergeant and a 12-year-old African-American child. They are embracing. The large arms of this officer holding this child who leans into him. And the child has tears streaming down his face. One of his parents tells the story. We went out to the streets with the intention of spreading love and kindness and to remind all people that they matter in this world. I noticed my son was struggling. He was inconsolable. He trembled, holding a free hugs sign as he bravely stood alone in front of the police barricade. Tears rushing from his eyes and soaking his sweater, he gazed upon them not knowing how the police would react. After a while, one of the officers approached him and extended his hand. The interaction was uncomfortable at first. There were generic questions about his favorite subject and what he liked to do in the summer. But the one that mattered hit straight to the heart. He asked my son why he was crying. My son responded about his concerns regarding the level of police brutality towards young black kids, was met with an unexpected and authentic, yes, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The officer then asked if he could have one of his hugs. This is how the disciples prepared the way for Jesus to arrive. It's how we do it too. As we meet each other face to face and talk heart to heart, as we embrace one another and walk side by side, speaking honestly and vulnerably about things that matter, Jesus moves right into the midst of us. As we rely on the good will of one another and recognize the ways all of us are dependent on each other, Jesus joins us on the journey. As we share the message of peace and practice all its ways, the mission becomes possible. And the one who is peace himself steps right in. Amen.